Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Spinov. I'm a data research scientist here at the center. Uh, usually these uh, talks are hosted by Paulus Yamin, who's our managing director. Unfortunately, he's not available today. So I'm uh, just for the duration of this talk, pretend that I'm Paulus Yamin. Uh, and our agenda today is first, we're gonna listen to a presentation by an early career researcher, Christopher Slislo from the University of Cologne. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my understanding is that while he is uh, in the chat room and he's able to chat with you over the chat box, he's not able to introduce himself in person just because there are some con connection issues. So if you have any questions to Christoph, you'll be able to ask them in the chat box or later contact him by his email that we'll share or uh, we'll also share a uh, QR code to his web page, so you'll be able to get in touch with him. And then after that, we'll hear a 45-minute presentation from Dr. Peter Hall, after which we'll give about 15 minutes for Q&A. And if you have any questions that are not answered during the session, again, you'll be provided with the contact information of our speakers, and you'll be able to get in touch with them. And um, uh, ask any questions that you have later. So just as a reminder, we are Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics, uh, and we provide consulting research and training services to uh, nonprofits and other organizations uh, in uh, areas of behavioral change. We uh, are funded by uh, the Penn uh, PP Arts and Sciences, as well as uh, the Penn's Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences program and through a series of uh, other grants that we received to uh, do behavior uh, to do behavior change uh, analysis in different settings. And this series of talks is almost uh, about to come to an end. This season of it at least, we have one more talk on July 28th when Erin Kupka from the University of Michigan is gonna give her presentation. And then we're gonna go on a little bit of a pause till the fall. The exact dates of when we will start will be announced later. And if you are in uh, on our listservs, you'll be given all the information, but we'll resume in the fall in potentially a slightly different format with fewer speakers per month, but you'll be given this information. And just as a reminder, uh, we are hosting a NOBIC conference in October this year, October 13th and October 14th, with an additional event on October 12th on norms in the developing world. Uh, and you are encouraged to submit uh, your papers and posters. The deadline is tomorrow, so there's only uh, under two, less than two days to submit. It's at our website, nobicconference.com. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to provide you with uh, the best answers that we have. And even if you're not submitting a paper or a poster, uh, we encourage you to just uh, pen down the dates of the event and just attend because it'll be a very interesting event. The previous events that we had uh, had a lot of success. And a few rules for our uh, event. I, I ask you that you please mute yourself. You should be muted automatically on entry, but if in case that doesn't happen, please make sure you're muted. We encourage you to keep your cameras on just to have your ex experience of this talk more uh, entertaining and interactive and to uh, feel it like it's more an in-person event. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask your questions in the chat box at any time. Me and uh, Eugen will be monitoring them and will voice them at the end of the talks. And uh, if you want to ask your question with your own voice, you're also encouraged to do that, uh, in which case during the Q&A session, uh, you can use the raise your hand button function on Zoom. Uh, we're being recorded and transmitted live on Facebook right now, and the recording of this session will be update, uploaded on our website, nobegtalks.com at the end of the session. So if for some reason the internet connection for you doesn't work out, or you have to hop off, or if you want to share this uh, video with someone who was not able to attend, you're more welcome to do so. Just attend nobegtalks.com at the end of the talk, and you'll be able to uh, have this and other talks there. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to proceed to the early career uh, researcher of today talk. 
So we are happy to present to you Christopher Slislow, who is a research associate at the Institute for Economic Policy and a PhD candidate at the University of Cologne. And you can uh, contact him by his email, which just in case I'm also going to be uh, pasting in the chat box if you want to have any questions. Again, as I said, unfortunately, Christoph will not be able to use his voice today to answer his questions just because of the internet connection. But my understanding is that he's available on chat and he will be able to uh, chat with you to the extent that his internet connection allows. Uh, and uh, his talk today is about social norms and elections, how elected rules can make behavior uh, appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, and let me just start the video. Okay. Hello, and welcome to my mini talk on elections and social norms. My name is Christopher Slieslo. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cologne, and this is joint work with Arno Apelstedt and Jana Freund. The starting point for this project is two part. We know that social norms matter for individual behavior. By social norms, we mean shared understandings about the appropriate actions for a given situation. So we focus on injunctive or prescriptive norms. And important to note here is that these kind of norms are often considered persistent, long-standing social constructs. Most individuals tend to learn and follow them, and the variation in the set of relevant social norms can provide a plausible explanation for puzzling behavior in a variety of social contexts. Now, a number of recent observations suggest that norms in a given context can change rapidly as a result of political events, such as elections or referenda. In 2016, shortly after the UK voted for Brexit, the country experienced a sharp rise in hate crimes and the Times quoted an official of the UN, as a result of the referendum, anti-immigrant and anti-foreigner rhetoric had become normalized. Similar claims were made in the US after the election of Donald Trump in the same crazy year. Jackson Katz, co-founder of the Gender Violence Prevention Program, was quoted by the Huffington Post. Trump's election normalized abusive behavior and gives implicit permission for others to perpetuate it. Beyond such anecdotes, there are also scientific studies which take up the idea of a change in the set of relevant social norms as a mechanism underlying observed behavioral effects of elections. So taken together, there is quite a bit of suggestive evidence for elections affecting long-standing social norms. However, a fundamental challenge in interpreting observational data in this context is that elections are generally not exogenous to the society, which makes it difficult to show that elections indeed causally influence social norms. Some of the before mentioned papers try to address this issue. However, in the existing studies, the effect of elections on social norms is typically inferred indirectly from observed behavior or from stated preferences. And with this project, we try to fill this gap and ask, can elections shift people's ideas of what is socially appropriate behavior in a given situation? So let me briefly give you the basic intuition behind our design. We ran a controlled online lab experiment with a total of 600 participants who were asked to rate actions in a specific scenario by their social appropriateness. This scenario is a variant of the dictator game in which an individual can either act pro-socially and give a fixed part of his or her endowment to a poorer fellow, or act selfishly and keep the whole endowment. In our main treatment variation, the dictator faces a code of conduct which has been elected via a referendum, a simple majority vote by all participants in this scenario. And this code of conduct asks people either to share, rule give, or not to share, rule don't. And participants in the control group rate actions in the absence of a rule, which serves as a benchmark scenario. The setting allows us to compare ratings of each action, give and don't give, across conditions with and without an elected rule, as well as across conditions with different rules. So the key features of our design summarize. First, we directly elicit social norms by incentivizing subjects to reveal their true beliefs about the most frequent rating of all other subjects. 
Second, we apply this method to investigate social norms concerning relatively clear-cut pro-social and selfish behavior in a simple scenario. And third, by exogenously manipulating the existence of an election as well as the election outcome and holding everything else constant, this design allows us to directly measure effects of elections on social norms. Okay, here's our main result. In the absence of an election, action give is rated socially appropriate and action don't give is rated moderately socially inappropriate. This is what happens when there's an elected code of conduct in place. We find that elections can indeed shift individual perceptions of social norms. The most striking result here is that under rule don't, mean and median ratings of the selfish action don't give become positive. Under rule don't, the average rating here is even higher than the average rating of action gives. So elections can indeed make inappropriate actions become socially appropriate. Okay, so to arouse your curiosity to read the full paper, let me quickly highlight some further interesting insights. First, by comparing different voting procedures, we find that elections can change social norms even if the election process is flawed. For instance, by introducing a voting fee, bribing voters, or excluding low-income voters. Second, by comparing our norm shifts with actual behavioral data, we show that social norms indeed predict behavior in the corresponding scenario. Third, an additional treatment variation to disentangle potential mechanisms suggests that both the social information contained in the majority vote and the social appropriateness of following rules per se play a significant role for the norm shift that we observe in our main treatment variation. And fourth, we find that elections can not only cause a shift in modal, median, and mean ratings, but also an increase in the variance of the distribution of ratings, which we relate to psychology, literature, and social consensus and norm clarity. So I mean by definition, for social norms to effectively govern behavior, it is important that these norms are collectively perceived and jointly recognized by members in the population, right? So this in turn means that the variance or the individual beliefs about the variance in rankings can be an important aspect when we think about cooperation in societies and issues like polarization and social cohesion. Okay, takeaways. Our studies provides the first clean evidence that elections do not only have formal consequences, but can also have a strong impact on social norms. In particular, and much in line with the anecdotal evidence reported above, we show that majority elected rules can cause inappropriate actions to become socially appropriate. Depending on the election outcome, elections can also increase the dispersion of appropriateness perceptions and lead to an erosion of an ex-ante consensus about what is ethically right and wrong. I'm very happy to chat about the study and related topics. Thanks for listening. Uh. Thank you very much to Christoph. Again, if you have any questions, uh, there are his co-authors in the chat box and you can contact uh, Christoph himself via the email. Uh, and on that note, we will go to our main speaker of today. Today, we are happy to present to you Dr. Peter Hall from Brown University. Uh, Dr. Peter Hall received his PhD in economics in MIT in 2017 and joined Brown uh, last, year, uh, last year in 2021 after working as an assistant professor at the University of Chicago and being a research fellow at Becker Friedman Institute, a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New England. Uh, he is a labor economist with research interests in applied econometrics, education, healthcare, and discrimination uh, with uh, several additional affiliations, and uh, what might be interesting to some of you, he's also participating in the mixtape sessions, uh, mixtape sessions uh, seminars in the fall, uh, which uh, I think might be interesting to all of you who are interested in methods. I'm actually just going to share a link to that event, where he, I think, I believe he's hosting two of the two of the classes there. And on that note, uh, I am gonna pass uh, my mic to uh, Peter. Great, um, thanks very much, Alex. That's a very kind introduction. Um, I think I can share my screen by stopping yours. Let me just try that. Okay, can folks see the screen okay? And hear me okay? 
Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me uh, to this great uh, seminar series. Uh, it's really nice to, to see uh, some, some faces, uh, including some familiar faces, but mostly unfamiliar faces. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Aislinn Bowring, who's also at Penn, and Alex Imas at the University of Chicago. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, your feedback and questions. This is still fairly early stage work and, and hopefully something which um, will be useful across uh, uh, the different fields and, and different uh, research interests. So we're interested in studying systemic discrimination, uh, theory and measurement. The motivation for this is probably um, doesn't really need to be said. You know, there have been widely documented disparities in various treatments or outcomes uh, by various protected groups, including race and gender, ethnicity, and other, other categories. Uh, they've been widely documented, but not always so easily understood. Uh, and different fields tend to approach, you know, understanding these disparities in, in different ways. So uh, in economics, which is, you know, my stomping ground, as well as some other quantitative fields, analyses of disparities like these typically focus on the possibility of what we're gonna call in this paper direct discrimination. And so by that, we mean differential treatment on the basis of the protected characteristic itself. Um, so just to give a little background and, and some folks here are, are, are more familiar with this than this than others, I'm sure. Um, so in econ, when we study discrimination, you sort of see the focus on direct discrimination from two angles. So first, when we write down theoretical models to try and understand how discrimination arises and propagates, Typically, at least historically, the focus tends to be on how, say, race or gender directly uh, affects a decision maker's actions through their preferences, that's Becker's sort of classic taste-based discrimination model, or through their beliefs, that's sort of Aigner and Kane or Phelps or Arrow's uh, models of statistical discrimination. So all of those things together tend to focus, again, on sort of the direct uh, reaction to, uh, say, race or, or, or gender. Uh, empirically, um, folks are probably familiar with, you know, this idea of, of audit studies or correspondence studies, not actually originally developed in econ, but has since really taken off in econ as a way of measuring causal effects of perceived race and gender on actions, such as in hiring uh, or lending decisions. Bertrand and Nathan is a, is a sort of famous paper in econ of that. And so both of these angles tell us that, you know, when we're thinking about discrimination in, in econ, we tend to be focused on these sort of direct or causal effects. But, and I don't need to you know, say this for, for many people in this room, I'm sure, a large body of, of work in, in other fields suggests that this focus on kind of direct discrimination uh, is incomplete potentially. Um, so in sociology, for example, in related fields, you know, they, they take this kind of systems-based approach where they study how discrimination can arise indirectly through non-group characteristics and sort of become embedded in non-group characteristics, say over time or across different domains. Um, and this is this what we're going to call systemic perspective on discrimination, you know, is echoed in a lot of different fields. So in, in law, there's this notion of disparate impact, which sort of captures both direct and systemic forms of discrimination. Uh, recently, of course, in computer science, there's been this big push to understand algorithmic unfairness, algorithmic bias, uh, which you can think of as a, as a kind of systemic discrimination in, in that sort of race or gender becomes kind of embedded in algorithmic out inputs, even if an algorithm is is uh, say race or gender blind. And so the point of this paper is to try and um, you know, bring some of these literatures together and, and sort of formalize some ways in which we can study these kinds of uh, systemic and indirect forms of, of discrimination. And so just to fix ideas you know, with a very simple illustration, um, let, me, let me walk through what, what we're calling systemic or direct indirect discrimination uh, in this paper and how we're differentiating it from that sort of classic view of, of direct discrimination. So, you know, I work in education uh, a little bit, so let's think about a simple example where we're, we're thinking about evaluating teachers, say professors, uh, for, for some form of promotion. And so we can imagine that we have three teachers here, you know, two female teachers, one male uh, teacher. And, you know, let's just suppose that we sort of know the ability, the true sort of teaching ability of these teachers. Um, that's just for, to, to keep things simple right now. And so we have two sort of average teachers and one very high performing teacher. And let's imagine that students sort of submit teaching evaluations, um, but students are biased. Uh, they're biased against female teachers, which is a fact that's been sort of documented in a number of papers, uh, including this paper by, by Mengele. So let's imagine that when students fill out their teaching evaluations, you know, even though these are both average sort of ability teachers, uh, the students tend to score the, the female teacher a bit lower. Now this would be or could be a form of direct discrimination. 
either preference-based or belief-based discrimination by students in which the students are sort of directly penalizing the teacher because she is a woman. Nevertheless, this high ability teacher sort of gets a, a, a decent grade um, because you know, the ability kind of offsets that, that bias. Okay, so this is the kind of discrimination that econ and other fields has long sort of focused on. We could measure this in an audit study where we randomize say the gender or the perceived gender of teachers uh, holding other qualifications fixed, for example. Um, but now to take the more systemic view, we're gonna think about rolling this, this scenario forward uh, to, to a second period and thinking about sort of a, a committee uh, evaluating these teachers for say tenure or, or promotion. And so the, kid, the committee is not going to be engaged in direct discrimination. They're gonna apply a gender neutral rule, which is just based on teaching evaluations, right? So they're just gonna say, well, if your teaching evaluation is three or, or above, you get, you get tenure. Otherwise you have to go find another job. Um, and so this is a gender neutral rule, right? The, the, the committee doesn't take into account the gender. If we were to apply a sort of, you know, uh, audit study on, uh, on tenure and promotion decisions, we would find no discrimination because it's all coming through this sort of teaching evaluation. Um, and in particular, you know, these two teachers who have the same uh, evaluations get treated the same uh, regardless of their gender. But nevertheless, you know, there is inequality or what some might call discrimination in this setting. Uh, if we think about teachers with the same underlying ability, they're being uh, promoted or, or tenured at, at different rates. Uh, and so this is kind of just a simple point, just to make the point that when we have sort of these systems, either sequentially or across different, uh, different settings, um, protected characteristics like gender and race can become embedded in non-group characteristics. In this case, the teaching evaluation is a signal which an audit study would like to hold fixed in order to make sort of causal claims about the effect of gender in the tenure and promotion decision. But by holding that fixed, we're sort of holding fixed embedded discrimination from an earlier period in those, in those signals itself. Uh, and again, so this is not, you know, this is kind of a simple idea, but it's, it's one that, that I think really sharply illustrates the, the limitation of this focus on direct discrimination. And just to be clear on, you know, is this really discrimination that's going on here? We have one more example from the real world, which is this uh, famous Supreme Court case in the US, Griggs versus Duke Power, which formalized the disparate impact standard uh, in, in the aftermath of the civil, civil rights laws. Um, what happened here was Duke Power is a company that had a, a, a um, policy for, for job transfers uh, at, at the company, which was found to be discriminatory because it required a high school diploma for workers to change jobs, even though these were manual labor jobs that didn't sort of require any higher education to, to uh, be productive at work. And so the Supreme Court found that even though the policy was race blind, black and white workers with equal educational um, qualifications were able to transfer at the same rate. Uh, the policy was discriminatory because it was using this, this signal of qualification, which embedded discrimination in the education market. So um, you know, black uh, workers tended to have uh, high school diplomas at lower rates because of earlier discrimination. And so the point here is that this is a real world example of that kind of direct discrimination. Um, and again, it would not be detected in a standard audit or correspondence study where we simply randomize perceived worker race and, and, and estimate the causal effects holding everything else uh, fixed. Nor incidentally, is it naturally modeled by classic taste-based or statistical discrimination models uh, in, in economics and other fields. And so the point of this paper is to just sort of formalize these ideas um, and, and bring them a little bit closer to the standard toolkit uh, uh, in, in social science, um, at least in, in, in economics. And so we're gonna do this in two ways. We're gonna develop a sort of general theoretical framework, which allows us to very precisely separate these ideas of direct and systemic discrimination. The reason for doing that, by the way, is that you know, we think of these things as having very different policy consequences. If there's direct discrimination versus systemic discrimination, there might be different ways of, um, of solving those things and potentially trade-offs in satisfying you know, those two objectives. And so that's why we think it's, it's important to create this sort of formal um, separation. Um, and we're gonna talk about sort of models of, of discrimination sort of in line with that taste-based versus statistical discrimination uh, uh, logic in, in the direct case. We're gonna distinguish between informational systemic discrimination, which arises from disparities in the signaling process. So for example, in that teacher evaluation uh, 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 scenario, we had uh, you know, the, the reviews being biased upwards for, for male teachers versus female teachers. And that's sort of a, a, a way in which sort of the signals of say productivity get 
uh, biased and embed systemic discrimination. We're also going to talk about what we call technological systemic discrimination, in which uh, uh, inequality arises from endogenous disparities in the productivity itself. So you can think of, you know, uh, black and white uh, high schoolers having different opportunities for summer jobs, and that creates endogenous differences in their human capital, which gets later penalized on the labor market. Uh, that would be a form of sort of technological system. So I'll say more about that with some formalization in a second. Um, and then the second half of the paper really is, is trying to think about how we can bring these objects to data. So we sort of know how to measure direct discrimination through again, uh, audit studies or correspondence studies, but measuring these indirect forms is a little trickier. Um, so what we're gonna do is propose a sort of general uh, decomposition based approach to back out measures of systemic discrimination from direct discrimination measures and what we call total discrimination measures. And we think that this can help us guide data collection and identification strategies in future work. And we have some uh, experimental and quasi-experimental uh, works in the field right now to, to illustrate this. Um, and so let me just quickly sketch the, the empirics here. So I'm gonna actually, uh, time permitting, uh, show you some empirical results where both on an online hiring platform experiment and in a field experiment using sort of previous correspondence study data, um, we're going to show you how you know, systemic discrimination can actually be measured. And we're also going to show you that when we measure it, it turns out to be a much larger share of, of inequality than, than the direct discrimination, which uh, we have typically focused on in, in that field. And so broadly, we think that this helps highlight how disparities uh, due to policies or stereotypes can become systemic and how they can uh, sort of persist and become very, very important, even when the original drivers are eliminated and even when sort of audit study or correspondence type studies wouldn't be able to detect them. Um, and so let me, before diving in, let me just echo what was said at the start. Um, please put any clarifying questions in the chat. I'm happy to stop and, and answer them, especially as we're going along. I'm looking forward to sort of more substantive discussion uh, at the end. Um, so let me start by just sort of sketching the theoretical framework. So I'm going to put a little bit of math on the, on the board just to make very precise what, what, what it is that we're actually interested in studying here. Uh, and in particular, we're going to think about a very particular setting just to make things concrete and able to use sort of specific words for things. But I want you to think about this setting as being an example of, of course, many different settings which could fit into this framework. So we're going to think about a, uh, a hiring experiment. So I'm a labor economist, so we're going to think about an employment setting. Uh, in which we have a set of hiring managers, which we're going to index by J, evaluating a set of workers, which we're going to index by I. Now we're going to imagine that workers belong to a group, uh, GI. GI could either be M or F. So you can think of this as male or female if you want, but obviously it's more general than that. Workers are going to have some latent productivity, Y star. So that's like their ability to perform the task. Uh, and they're also going to have sort of non-group signals of that productivity, which we'll call S. So this could be things like their work experience, letters of recommendation, you know, how they perform in interviews, things that sort of signal their underlying productivity. Um, now, the managers are going to observe, they're not going to observe productivity directly, but they're going to observe G and S, and they're going to take an action. You could think of that as a hiring action or setting a wage. Um, and for now, we're just going to imagine there being this reduced form action rule which maps uh, group and non-group characteristics into that wage or hiring or other decision. Now we can microfound this with sort of some model of preferences or beliefs about productivity. And we, we do that in the paper, but now for now, uh, just to define things, we can just imagine this kind of reduced form action rule as being uh, some, something derived from that underlying structure. Um, now to make this kind of interesting in the systemic perspective, what we're gonna do is embed this single hiring task into a larger system, or if you want to think of it, economy of other managers or firms or sectors or time periods, sort of other, other ways in which sort of discrimination could, could come into this, this single action. So we're going to imagine that workers enter the system or the economy with some measure of qualification, Y0. I'll talk much more about what Y0 could be in, in a few slides. Um, suffice to say right now, you could either have Y0 be you know, the worker's productivity itself, or you could have it be some earlier, you know, measure of productivity, allowing productivity to be generated endogenously from Y0 and from the actions of, of other agents in the system. So I'll have more to say about what Y0 is and, and how important that is for our analysis uh, in a few slides, but that's the basic setup just to, just to put it out there. And with that setup, what we can do is we can define sort of three types 
of discrimination. And so this is the one of the early theoretical contributions of this paper is just to formalize these as and link them to sort of mathematical concepts. So we're going to say that the manager's actions exhibit what we call direct discrimination. Uh, if their action rule depends sort of structurally on, on the group. So if by switching, you know, holding fixed the non-group characteristics S, by switching the perception of the worker from group M to group F, from male to female, if that changes the action rule, that's going to be sort of what we call direct discrimination. That's the sort of discrimination that would be picked up in a randomized software or correspondence. What we call systemic discrimination is, is therefore going to be a bit different. It's going to be disparities in the action rule, which arise indirectly through the non-group characteristics S among equally qualified workers. So we're going to condition on Y0. We're going to hold fix the qualification metric itself. We're going to hold fixed in the action rule a given uh, sort of perception of the group G. And then we're just going to see how indirectly through S, the actions correlate with the group among equally qualified workers. Okay, so this is like a little, maybe a little less intuitive mathematically, but it's, it's kind of reflecting that Griggs versus Duke Power example from the beginning where, you know, if we take a worker, we fix their, their race, and we see how their, um, you know, promotion or, or transfer abilities differ, um, you know, through their, through their uh, high school diploma, that's going to be a form of indirect or systemic discrimination here, uh, as long as we sort of con condition on, on the qualification for completing the task. Now, with these two forms, we can combine them and we can think about total discrimination, which is going to be differences in the action uh, uh, that are correlated with, with the group among equally qualified workers for either reason. So this could either be because of direct or indirect discrimination. And the fact that these things are going to come together is going to be helpful for the measurement where we, again, kind of back out the indirect or systemic component from measures of total and direct discrimination. So I'll say more about that. Okay, and so you know this is just a framework, right? Hopefully, it's a useful one for thinking through different examples. Before talking about some of the theoretical examples we've explored, let me come back to this question of Y zero because you can see from these definitions that the choice of Y zero is really going to matter in terms of what we call discrimination, what we call direct discrimination, what we call systemic discrimination. And just as a small editorial before jumping into the ways in which it matters, this is kind of inherent, I think, in any study of uh, systemic or, or non-direct discrimination. With direct discrimination, we sort of know how to define what we want to hold fixed. We want to hold fixed everything but race, everything but gender. And then we can define the causal effect of, of race and gender per se. Once we go to this broader view, we need to take a stand on what we want to hold fixed and what we don't. Because different non-group characteristics can embed discrimination and bias in different ways. And we as the researcher should therefore you know, take a stand on a kind of normative stand, if you will, on what, um, what comparisons we want to be making, what, what sort of qualification metrics we want to be using. And so to that end, um, you know, we have a big discussion in the paper about this. I think it's a really important part of this, this analysis. By varying what we call the qualification metric Y0, we can bring focus to different systemic forces which may drive inequality. And so just to give you two extreme examples, on one hand, we could set Y0 as the researcher 2S to all non-group characteristics. That's going to cause our definitions of direct and total discrimination to align and be the same thing. Uh, and so there's no role for systemic factors in that choice of Y0. And we think of that, therefore, as kind of implicit in many, uh, though not all, economic analyses of, of discrimination. Another extreme view, you know, you might have the, the view if we're studying racial discrimination that race is a social construct. It has no sort of inherent um, you know, differences in terms of productivity. And so we can imagine setting Y0 to a constant, say to zero, such that any disparities across race or across gender are attributable to some form of discrimination you know, at some point in time in some systems. So that's another extreme view where we, we really count everything as being sort of coming from these indirect channels. Uh, and of course, in between those extremes, there's a lot of interesting territory and interesting middle grounds. So we could imagine, for example, setting Y0 equal to Y star. So we're comparing equally uh, productive workers, that's going to align our notion of total discrimination with um, uh, disparate impact in, in the law, where we're trying to compare, you know, the treatment, the effective treatment of, of different workers uh, 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 holding fixed business necessity or, or qualification for, for completing the job. We could also imagine setting Y0 to some initial labor market productivity or qualification, which is going to allow for systemic discrimination to arise through 
uh, human capital in this case or through the qualification. So again, much more discussion in the paper, but let me leave it there and just point out that I think this is a really crucial part of any analysis of systemic discrimination, which I, I think you know, researchers like me should really uh, take seriously when, when trying, to, trying to study these. Now, let me just briefly mention the sources. So once we've set up this framework, we can think about what are the drivers of these different forms of discrimination. So just to quickly recap, you know, when we're thinking about direct discrimination, there's a rich literature in econ thinking of different ways that that can arise, again, through beliefs or through preferences. Uh, for systemic discrimination, we're going to similarly kind of, kind of try and distinguish two potential drivers. One is informational systemic discrimination in which there are differences in the signaling process of this qualification or productivity metric. So differences in the sort of signals of, of, of productivity that arise. Again, think back to that sort of teaching example. There could also be technological uh, systemic discrimination in which it's not the signal, but it's actually the, the productivity itself. So think again to that uh, you know, summer job example when thinking about human capital. And so now we can formalize these things mathematically and we can talk about how we might be able to separately uh, measure them, which we think is a kind of uh, contribution. To this work. Now in the paper, we have a bunch of theoretical applications. So this is kind of the high level summary. Um, but you know we have much we drill down into a bunch of different uh, settings to try and show you what this kind of framework can buy us in terms of understanding say previous papers previous empirical papers as well as making the new theoretical predictions which we might be able to test in our experiments so let me not dwell on this slide there's actually more than these three examples in the paper but these are the three main ones we think are, are most interesting uh, if folks have other ideas of directions to explore um, please do let us know we'd be happy to but let me now um, turn on to turn turn to the empirical side of things. So once we've established this theoretical framework, now we can think about you know can we actually distinguish direct and systemic discrimination? Can we separate those things out in the real world? Um, can we bring this theoretical framework to data? So I'm going to do this in two steps. I'm first going to show you uh, a fairly simple and highly stylized online hiring experiment where we create settings such that we can both measure and sort of uh, you know, uh, see how, how direct and systemic discrimination arise and persist. And then I'll show you a sort of more real world field experiment where we try and estimate these things uh, using actual uh, uh, sort of more high, high stakes decisions. So in the online hiring experiment, what we did was we recruited a bunch of um, participants from the prolific uh, sort of online uh, task platform. Folks here might be familiar with prolific. Um, what we did was we, we recruited a bunch of people and we randomly assigned them to one of three roles. Uh, workers, we call recruiters, and we call hiring managers. So what workers did was they completed a test of their basic knowledge of math, business, and history. So specifically what we did was we generated a bunch of questions in math, business, and history, and we randomly gave the workers um, 20 of these questions uh, in, in two parts. So there's a part A with 10 questions and a part B with, with 10 questions. And then we scored those questions and figured out how much, uh, how many of the questions the worker got right on each part. Now, what's importantly for the analysis that's about to follow, there was no difference by gender, by self-reported gender, uh, in worker performance on the two halves of the test, nor in how well the first half of the test predicted the second half, or sort of the, the reliability of, of, of the test. Um, and that's going to be important again for interpreting this also in a second. Um, so that's what the workers did. Then what we did was we took the recruiters. We showed them the part A performance of a set of workers as well as the worker's gender. Uh, and then we asked the recruiters to submit a wage for how much they would like to pay to have that uh, worker work for them. Um, and the way that we then paid them given the wage was based on the part B performance and incentive of that wage. So basically what we're asking the recruiters to do is to predict the part B performance from the part A performance and the self-reported gender. Uh, and they have incentives to do that as accurately as possible. Now, at this stage, if we see any disparities by gender, that's going to reflect what we call direct discrimination. It could be stereotypes that, say, women uh, are, are sort of less knowledgeable about math, business, and history. It could be uh, direct bias. So even though I think that men and women are equally able at, at um, you know, completing these tests, I just don't want to pay women as, as much as men or you know, some other form of, of direct discrimination. But importantly here, it's going to be direct discrimination because we've established that there's no sort of differences in the test uh, by, by gender. Uh, 
Um, so that's going to be the first phase of the experiment. And then in the second phase, we're going to roll things forward, just like we did in that early teaching example. And we're going to give a set of managers both um, you know, the, the gender of a worker and the wages which a recruiter paid them in the previous period. And then those managers are going to submit those uh, promotion wages, if you will, uh, again, using an incentive compatible technique. And so here, what the managers are trying to do is, again, predict sort of the underlying per performance of the workers. But now the signal that managers are using to make that prediction is the recruiter's wage, as well as the, the worker's gender. And so that signal could embed direct discrimination by the recruiters. And that's going to allow us to separately look at both systemic discrimination through that indirect channel and any additional direct discrimination. Um, and so just to, that's the basic sketch. Let me just show you sort of the, the, the high level results. Peter, do, just a quick question, if you don't mind, about the setup. If you could go back to the slide, um, can you clarify how much the managers knew about what the recruiters knew? So do you tell the managers, the recruiters saw the, the, you know, the faces and the performance? So how much, how much information do you give them? My understanding is that the managers knew what the recruiters saw and knew what the game is. Um, what the managers don't know is what was their discrimination by recruiters. And so one important thing, which we're going to be, I haven't shown you that there is, but there is discrimination by recruiters. One thing that we're going to be thinking about going forward is, you know, separating out beliefs here um, more, but they do know the, my understanding is they do know the sort of setup of the game. Um, okay, so there was direct discrimination by recruiters. If we look at workers who are male and female with different performance signals, and we look at the first stage wage that was submitted, Males are given a higher wage sort of uniformly across the, the performance signal distribution. So again, that could be because of stereotypes or preferences or you know, any other of those traditional channels for direct discrimination. What's interesting is if we then look at the sort of second stage decision, the manager wages, we also see a disparity um, across, across self-reported gender. And again, this, this disparity is discrimination because males and females have underlying the same uh, productivity or performance on average. So here we see a, a, a 0.9 highly statistically significant gap in the wages that managers submit uh, to male versus female workers, male workers being paid higher. However, if we take this gap and we control for the signal that managers see, so we run a regression of the wage that managers paid on the gender of the worker, and the signal that the managers saw, in other words, the recruiter's wage offer, well, then the disparity in, in gender goes away entirely. This is no longer a statistically significant gap. Instead, what looks like to be happening is that all of the discrimination or most of the discrimination among managers is coming through this indirect channel, coming through this, this non-gender signal uh, of, the, uh, of the recruiters. Uh, and so, you know, we can go a step further and apply what we, work out to be a, a, a Waka Blinder uh, decomposition, Kitagawa Waka Blinder decomposition in the paper, where we can actually you know, precisely measure the direct discrimination and systemic discrimination components of the manager's uh, uh, wage offers. And we can see exactly the same thing, that most of the discrimination here is coming through uh, sort of the systemic channel instead of the direct. Now, this is just an online sort of hiring experiment. It's very simple. We sort of set it up to be as simple as possible mostly to fix ideas and sort of illustrate our method, um, you might wonder whether this kind of pattern can also arise in the real world. And so for that, um, we have a second now field experiment where what we're going to do is modify a sort of standard correspondence study. And that's going to allow us to measure both direct discrimination as a standard audit or correspondence study is able to do, uh, as well as uh, these, these uh, indirect forms of discrimination which we, which we model. So just to catch everyone up in case you're not familiar with the sort of standard correspondence study, typically what happens is, you know, um, recruiters or, or, you know, some other uh, uh, decision maker gets submitted a profile of an individual, say a resume, uh, which has information like which school they go to, what work experience they have, as well as a salient signal of, say, their race or gender, typically through names. And so what happens is we're going to randomize the names holding fixed the other things on the resume, and we're going to look at the effect of say gender in this case, or in this case, race, uh, on, on the actions, say the hiring decisions. And so here we can imagine we have two groups of resumes where we've randomly varied the race. This is a, say a white applicant and this is a black applicant. Uh, and we've, we're holding fixed the other things on the resume like their education. And so typically what we would find here 
uh, that's been found in many different settings is that uh, when you randomly make the applicant white by giving them a distinctively white name, there's some issues with using names to infer race, but let's, let's move past that for, for now, um, that the, the white uh, named workers, white named workers tend to be hired at a, at a higher rate. Um, and so that's typically what we're going to find. And that's going to be a measure, again, of direct discrimination, which says that there's a causal effect of, of race per se on the action. What we're going to do is take an audit study that was run, and we're going to modify it um, in what we are starting to call a recursive correspondence study, where just like in that previous lab experiment, we're going to take the resumes and we're going to think about moving them forward in time. And so we're going to take the resumes, we're going to take the decisions that were actually taken on the resumes, and then we're going to embed those decisions into a new set of resumes, uh, which tracks the worker's work experience. And so we're going to take seriously the fact that this worker got hired and this worker didn't in this audit study. And then we're going to add a line to the resumes of the workers that were hired that says, I was hired for this, for this job. Um, and so now we have sort of these modified, endogenously generated resumes, which come from both our experiment, experiment and from the initial corresponding study. And from differences in the, say, hiring rates or wages of these resumes in the second stage, we can now track sort of a more comprehensive measure of discrimination, which accounts for sort of any differences, both endogenously and, and directly. In the, in, the, in the races. Um, and so that's gonna be our measure of total discrimination. And then what we can do further is generate a new set of resumes, which looks exactly like sort of the, where we take the, the white resumes from before and we say randomly vary some of them to be, to be black. And so now the, by comparing this new set of resumes to this previous set of resumes, where we hold fixed, held fixed the endogenous work experience, but randomly vary the, the perceived race of the worker, again, using names, uh, using in the traditional fashion. Now we have a way of measuring sort of total discrimination through these, these two resumes here. So again, we can measure overall discrimination by moving forward the resume study and uh, sort of seeing how subsequent decisions are, are uh, impacted by the previous ones. We can then measure direct discrimination by creating a new set of randomized audits based on the initial endogenous set. And from that, we can now back out sort of systemic direct and total using the same tools as what we were doing uh, in the prolific platform. Okay, so we call this a recursive correspondence study. Um, we've, we've so far just, just rolled it out in one setting using a very high profile audit study uh, by uh, the great uh, Deborah Pager, um, who really was one of the, the Main, main drivers of using these kind of correspondent audit or correspondent studies uh, in, in the social sciences. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, again, recruit some hiring managers uh, now through sentiment. Um, we're going to, and these are, real, these are real hiring managers. They have an average experience of, of four and a half years. Um, we're gonna use the audit study vari uh, variation from Pager's, uh, Pager's study, um, which found very large effects on uh, race on interview requests. And then we're gonna create three sets of resumes, just like in that previous picture, which we're gonna to show to these hiring managers at, at Sentiment um, and, and varying either the name of the applicant or varying both the name and this endogenous job history, just like I was showing before, we're gonna be able to now back out um, uh, direct and total discrimination using this uh, incentive compatible way of, of evaluating uh, uh, willingness to pay effectively. Um, and so just to give you a high level set of results, I think uh, uh, these, these, are, these are kind of interesting insofar as they show that, that those patterns we were just showing you online in the lab do actually tend to uh, uh, hold up as well in the field. If we just look at the uh, likelihood of, of hiring among these um, uh, hiring managers that we recruited online, um, if we compare you know, just the direct discrimination component, so we just make that outside comparison of uh, sort of endogenously generated white resumes and the same resumes where we flip randomly the, the race, the perceived race to be black, we actually find very little difference. So it turns out that in this, in this platform, um, holding fixed non-race characteristics, just varying the sort of distinctively race names, uh, there actually is very little difference in, in the hiring rates online. However, um, if we make the total comparison, right? So if we make the total comparison between white endogenous resumes and black endogenous resumes, we don't vary the names, but we roll forward the sort of non-race signals uh, through the initial uh, 
audit study, we do find a very large gap. And so again, just like before in the online experiment, this suggests that there's a large amount of systemic discrimination coming from the other items on the resume that are not sort of distinctively white or distinctively black. And so, you know, we can see that both with hiring and, and for wages. So the same pattern arises for wages. Uh, if we just randomize race in the second stage, we don't see big gaps in the offered wage for white and black applicants. However, we do see very large effects uh, endogenously arising through the, through the job responsibilities. And so, you know, the point here, here's some numbers just to put it into, into, uh, into perspective and, and make things very precise. The point here is just that if we run a standard sort of correspondence study in the setting, it turns out that, you know, there is a little bit of a gap, but the vast majority of the gap would not be detected by that sort of exogenous varying the perceived race uh, channel. Instead, most of the discrimination is really arising indirectly. And so I think this, this illustrates the fact that you know, we need to take seriously the possibility that systemic forces are just as, if not much more important for explaining inequality uh, in, in high state settings like employment. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm gonna wrap up actually a little bit on the early side, which is great, because I, I hope that it can be a robust kind of discussion uh, folks are interested. But the point of this paper is to really, you know, again, try and bring together some literatures and push, in my view, economics a little bit forward in terms of how we think about discrimination, both from a theoretical perspective in terms of how we model that and from an empirical perspective in terms of how we measure. Uh, and so again, moving beyond direct discrimination, as I said before, I think generally is gonna require us taking a normative stance on the reference point of qualification. Uh, and that's going to be a stance that I, I hope that you know we we discuss more when we when we talk about discrimination in, in our various analyses. Um, we we talked about how systemic discrimination can arise from two kind of distinctive channels, and, and I think there's much more work to be done in terms of studying those channels and and, and quantifying their importance. Uh, and and you know in order to quantify them, we are going to need to require new methodological, new econometric tools, such as the sort of recursive uh, correspondence study that I was mentioning before. Um, now, in our empirics, we show that the stuff matters, at least in, in, the, in the settings that we've looked at so far. Systemic discrimination can arise and persist. This can happen both, you know, I've been focusing a lot on this talk on how past biases accumulate and perpetuate. So I've talked a lot about multi-stage actions happening over time. Just to say very quickly here, you know, that, that's not the only way that systemic discrimination can arise and persist. It can also come from across markets in a given time period. So if you think about that, disparate impact case, Griggs versus Duke Power, that was really about sort of a contemporaneous effect of education markets hitting labor markets. We have other discussions of those examples in the paper. Uh, and just the final thing I'll say is that, you know, I think there are potentially very high returns to developing these measures, not just academically, but for policy. And so I think as folks here, I'm sure are aware, there's been a big push towards understanding structural or systemic inequalities in our society. Uh, I'm again a labor economist, so I know the one reference point I know is that the US EEOC, which is in charge of uh, understanding and measuring uh, discrimination in, in US labor markets, recently launched a huge number of, I should say, investigations into systemic discrimination. Uh, and, and they were especially interested in facially neutral hiring practices, uh, which, which by definition sort of don't have any direct discrimination in them. And so that I think really does motivate work like this and hopefully work of others in, in this room uh, for, for helping us understand these things. So let me stop there. Very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share this work. Uh, we're really excited uh, about it. Ho hopefully that excitement is, is a little contagious. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, this was very interesting and I'm gonna pass the word to Eugen Zeman who will moderate this discussion and who might have some questions of his own. Great. Yeah, Peter, thanks so much. Uh, um, we rarely have, maybe if you want to just keep your, your slide share, uh, you know, um, shared, that might be easier to just jump back and forth. Um, I'm sure you appreciate not being sort of interrupted in a typical econ manner. So uh, we don't usually have speakers uh, end on time. Um, so let me kick off with a question, maybe while we're waiting for others. So if anybody has a question, just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, so let me just ask the first question, which is, uh, great stuff. I do wonder about some of the mechanisms that you show. So maybe before I ask the specific question, let me just clarify that in the second experiment, you also gave specific information to the managers about the recruiters, or had you not any access to that initial sort of historic information from this past um, pager data? 
That's a great question that I don't and I, I don't want to give a definite answer to. This is fairly new stuff and, and I forget exactly what we told them. So that's a great question. Yeah. I believe I believe we we tried to inform people, but uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know offhand. I'm sorry for not being Yeah. Question. No, so so the reason why I, I keep asking that question is because I do wonder about uh, sort of what's going on on the belief side of the manager. So you can imagine that. Um, they might form some second order beliefs about once they observe sort of the outcome of what the recruiters actually have done. They may or may not form even self-serving beliefs, assuming that, you know, the recruiters had already engaged in some sort of discrimination. And so because they put forward a negative example, it sort of allows me to carry that forward and not feel too bad about myself, right? And so what would be interesting is to understand, and, and there's a way for you to test this, I mean, with additional treatments, in which you either explicitly disclose to participants that um, recruiters had access to both performance and gender or race or whatever you want to give them. And in other treatments, you don't. You just tell them explicitly about the performance, but you don't explicitly tell them about the gender and this other thing. If there's a difference between how managers then treat the result, then you can imagine that they assume that there's been some underlying discrimination and that has potentially yielded the result that they see. That connects well to sort of norms and sort of self-serving biases and all of that. So, so maybe you're not at that point yet, but I wonder how you feel about sort of this potential mechanism. I, I think that's exactly right. I think that's something we're interested in, in doing. I think it would be fairly straightforward, as you say, just to add kind of an informational intervention on top of this, where we give them some information and see how that you know, changes their, their actions. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. I think it's very interesting, especially you know, in this framework when we are able to delineate sort of direct and systemic discrimination. I sort of went by this too quickly, but you know, there's this this notion of how we can have reversals in direct discrimination to offset systemic forms, kind of you might call it reverse discrimination. Like think of it as like affirmative action or things like that. The extent to which that is going to be effective is very much tied to this idea of beliefs and and how much is understood in the information set. So I think for drilling down this idea of aware versus unaware sort of decision-making, we really do need to add that experimental arm and it's, it's something we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do. Um, but, but thank you. And, and, I, and we, should all, we should do it in both of these, you know, because again, this lab experiment, when we do this, it's like a little artificial, but given that this is based on sort of real world data, I think it becomes even more, more important uh, and, and, and a sort of experienced hiring managers. Then I think yeah. the information becomes interesting. Great, great. Yeah, I have more stuff, but let's uh, give the word to Pavitra, who has her hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Oigen. Yeah, thanks, Peter. This was a, a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, okay. So, so I, so I mean, so I'm trying to understand the systemic versus direct discrimination, and to me, at least, the idea seems more like it's just sort of, uh, you know, uh, upper, I mean. Uh, so the consequence of having say accumulated discrimination, right? So there is a discrimination in the first stage and it accumulates and it becomes, you know, so your qualification kind of goes down because you, you I mean, you, you have less opportunities in the first stage. And so you don't, and, and so you move to the second stage and then you're discriminated further because you didn't get the previous opportunity. So is, is that what, I mean, that's my first question. Like, is that what really systemic discrimination is that, you know, at every, you know, over a period of time, you get discriminated at each period and the first period discrimination affects your second period discrimination and so on. That, that, is, that is one piece of it. So I'm, I'm not a sociologist. So I have done a lot of reading in, in this literature in the last year or two. My, my understanding is that, you know, there's two types of systemic or structural discrimination that are distinguished. One is called past and present discrimination in which sort of things accumulate uh, uh, over time. And so that's, that's sort of what I've been focusing on uh, in this talk because it's a little easier to talk through and, and especially easier to, to run experiments on. Um, there's another form though, uh, which is called side effect discrimination. Uh, and that's something which doesn't happen sort of across time, but it happens across settings or cross markets in a, in a given point in time. And so one, one thing that we didn't really get a chance to talk much about today, but I think it's important, is this idea of signaling across markets as a, as a way that systemic discrimination can arise. So in this Burstein et al. paper, I'm not sure if you're familiar, the idea is that they look at um, uh, MBAs, male and female MBAs, and they think about how they signal their sort of willingness to work, I guess, uh, outside employment, 
and they show that sort of female uh, MBAs tend to shade their sort of aggressiveness in the labor market depending on whether or not they're being observed by male MBAs. And so this idea that, well, maybe there's discrimination in gender discrimination in the labor market and that affects sort of endogenous investments in, I'm sorry, in, in the marriage, there's, there's direct discrimination in the marriage market and that it affects endogenous investments in the labor market in a given point in time. And so I, I don't want to give the impression that systemic discrimination is just about the sort of accumulation over time. Uh, our framework is also going to capture these kinds of sort of simultaneous side effect discrimination across markets. Um, it's going to be harder to measure those things because the nice thing about over time is right, we have this sort of sequential set of actions we can track. Um, but I, yeah, I think that that's, that's something which, which is important to, to emphasize. Right. Sorry, I have just one more question is that this in the experiment, the audit study that you did. So it's interesting that you find direct discrimination in the first stage, but you don't find direct discrimination in the second stage. And I mean, it's basically the same experiment, right? So I is it because you have different audiences that are evaluating the study? Is that what you think the reason is? Are you talking about the first lab experiment or the field experiment? Because I have slightly different answers. The f actually, both both of them, but I think maybe the field experiment, the audit study, because you don't find any direct discrimination in the audit study in the second stage, but you find it in the first stage. Yeah, so I think... So it kind of nicely fits your story, but I don't understand why that happens. It's a great question. It's something we need to understand better. Um, you know, it's a different setting, so I don't quite remember the original setup from the from the pager study, but but it is obviously a very different setting than sort of online hiring managers uh, arranged through this through this platform. I think it's also a different time. Like I think that, you know, in, I think not to say that we've come that far uh, in terms of minimizing direct discrimination, but I think in the last 20 years, it's certainly at least become more of something that that hiring managers and employers are, are aware of. And so it's it's possible, and this is just me off the top of my head hypothesizing, it's possible that sort of direct discrimination has become a much more salient thing uh, such that if we do it 20 years later, there's much less of that than there was in the original 2003 study. Um, but in line with our framework, that's not to say that sort of the effects of that initial discrimination have gone away. And in fact, that's kind of the point of what we're, what we're showing here. Um, I think just to answer in the first setting, it's, it's maybe a little bit easier because things are a little more controlled. It's just a different type of signal. So the, the managers see you know, a human generated prediction of productivity as opposed to this sort of test-based prediction. And I think they just put more weight on it. So, and in fact, we can show that formally that like the R squared is much higher in the second stage uh, on the signal than the first stage. And I think that's probably because it's just like a different type of signal. And so, yeah, those are, neither of those are bulletproof answers, but it, I agree it's really interesting and it's useful for our, for our illustration, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that I think we should, we should also understand better. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Great, so we don't have uh, any questions uh, in the chat right now. So let me just follow up. For one, by the way, um, I'm gonna post a paper now that you may or may not know. Um, it's a management science paper by Katie Muckman and colleagues. And you might find the paper interesting because they sort of study uh, hiring decisions and sort of discriminatory decisions in, in sort of gender diversity. And so they study some of the ideas that, that you did, of course not from a model perspective but sort of the mechanics of how hiring officers sort of make decisions and, and so on just might be of interest in this. So I just post, put that in the chat. Um, so maybe a question sort of related to, to my initial thought is, and so maybe, maybe this goes beyond the model um, and sort of the goal that you have, but I wonder how we should think about intent in, in discriminatory behavior. So if we go back to the very first slide that you, you, you used, um, and, and talk about sort of evaluations of, of, of professors and sort of how there is sort of the, the discrimination. Um, when, when we think about this type of setting, what we know is that depending on what the committee knows, the behavior that they exhibit could very well just be uh, purely rational. They just go by the metric. They assume the metric is fair. They assume the metric is capturing what we want to capture. And then the discriminatory behavior is not really discriminatory, right? But then if they know and they actively still go with that because they say, well, we don't have anything else and so let's just roll with this metric, then they actively engage in discrimination. So how does intention, if at all, enter the model? And do you believe that this could produce maybe 
different types of predictions if, if we think about um, uh, intentions in, in this context? A great question. So my understanding from both the legal side of things and from the broader sociological literature side of things, there is less emphasis placed on intent than conventionally placed on it in, say, econ or, or focuses of direct discrimination. And so in particular, you know, in the disparate impact case I mentioned in Greek, Griggs versus uh, Duke Power, I, I'm not sure if I put it on the slide. I think I didn't. So the Supreme Court was very explicit, actually, in their ruling uh, and in saying that intent did not enter into this decision. Now, obviously, this happened in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Act, and I think a lot of policies like this went up in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Act as a way of sort of indirectly discriminating. Um, and so I think it was important, given that, that the Supreme Court said that, and they have been very explicit in that, and future legislation and sort of enforcement policies have also been very clear that the finding of disparate impact has no, it has no bearing on the intent behind the, the policy. Similarly, when we think about algorithmic discrimination, you know, the, the, the algorithm has no intent, right? It's a sort of mechanical object, uh, and yet it sort of creates these kinds of indirect discrimination uh, and, 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 and therefore sort of highlighting the fact that intent is, is less important. Um, you know, sort of in the sociological literature as well, you know, when, when we think about systemic or structural discrimination, I think there is this sort of push towards making it less about individual actors' intent um, because, you know, it's, it's, that's sort of where people go when you, when you mention discrimination. I think the idea is that discrimination can be embodied outside of any individual and can sort of persist and, and be embedded in, in non-individualistic systems. So my take, and again, I'm kind of going off the top of my head here a little bit, is that intent is kind of less important for establishing these things. Now, that's not to say that it's not important for thinking through policy responses. And this gets back to your earlier point. You know, if we think that the evaluators are just sort of passing the buck, like letting, letting sort of an early stage actor discriminate and then letting that go by because they wanted to discriminate and they knew it was going on, that has a very different policy consequence than if it's sort of totally unintentional and an informational intervention could, could solve it. And so those are my two answers. I think like from a high level perspective in terms of the theory, it becomes less important to put that part of the formalization. But when we think about policy responses, I think it is, it is very important. Yeah, and that's exactly what my follow-up question would have been in a way. When we think about the policies, it would be very interesting to see what you can do about the discrimination that you see on sort of the hiring side, right? Because if you can actually fix people's wrong beliefs, um, misguided beliefs, then that would be quite easy to do, right? But it's, if it's like deeply rooted discriminatory type of preferences, that might be much more challenging. Right? I will say that, again, what's kind of interesting here is that if you correct people's beliefs by saying, look, in this previous stage, you know, female teachers were, were, were given deflated ratings. The response to that is direct discrimination, right, in the second stage. And so this is another thing I think that comes out of this literature and that, you know, we're starting to see some discomfort around in, in the public discussion is that you, you, the, use, the use of direct discrimination to sort of offset, offset systemic factors and, and zero out total discrimination is not, not without controversy. So but yeah. I, totally, I totally agree that in terms of thinking through what the menu of policies is, yeah, understanding information and intent is, I think, uh, is a key step. Yeah, I mean, in a way, you could also think of these interventions from a sort of organizational, sort of social norms type of perspective, because maybe I fix your beliefs, but you still think everybody else is doing that in your position anyway, right? So, so maybe part of the intervention is not just fixing your beliefs about first stage, mm -hmm. It's yeah. maybe fixing your beliefs, if at, at all possible, um, to interventions about what people in the hiring sort of like who are sort of horizontally next to you uh, in a decision space um, I do in their hiring decisions. Right. So that probably my point is essentially this is amazing stuff, and it opens up so many possibilities of what to do in the next step. And I'm assuming at some point you will be interested about well, now that we've discovered all these different forces, how can we actually achieve like a more equitable uh, environment, right? And so so that's where going into the mechanisms of second order beliefs, understanding the norms, understanding sort of these type of things will be relevant to you. Right? I'm, I'm very interested in that stuff. I hope others are as well, because it's going to take a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of work. But I think, yeah, I think the mechanisms is kind of the next big step in the policy responses, as well as making these methods, these empirical methods sort of more robust and generally applicable outside of these kind of more controlled experimental settings. Yeah.
Great. Um, any any other questions from the audience? We have uh, two ish minutes left. I have yeah. a question actually. If uh, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so if you can go back to that slide with the tenure promotion thing. So I'm just thinking of the next step. So if there was something after tenure promotion, and then what happens is because of the discrimination, uh, one person lost the ability to get tenure. And then because of that, they're like, I mean, if, if it wasn't tenure, it was something like getting into college, and then they would get worse credentials and their CV would like get spoiled because of that. So this uh, discrimination also accumulates in the form of uh, so like uh, human capital that people accumulate. And I'm trying to think of if there's any public policy that can be done to prevent that. And the problem is that like it seems like it is a problem, but there's no party that will be responsible or will be able to uh, provide a remedy for that. Have you thought about what can be the kind of like the approach here? Good question. Yeah. So I, I would say that, you know, this, this step, this sort of link in the system chain is, is about informational systemic discrimination. Like there's a signal of productivity that's getting distorted. If there's a second stage where, because this person wasn't promoted, they, their, you know, human capital suffers and that affects their productivity in future decisions, that would be an example of what we call technological systemic discrimination. So that, that's actually a nice way of differentiating those things in this, in this example. In terms of policy solutions, I mean, people talk a lot about the pipeline, right? The sort of fact that these things accumulate in many stages over time, such that if we could fix something early in the pipeline, we can forestall harder to solve problems in the future. So in this case, if you know we were able to do a rigorous evaluation, like an audit study of evaluations in the space and see that there was this disparity and sort of make some attempts to adjust for that, again, that would be kind of a second, an intermediate stage here where we do reverse quote unquote direct discrimination to offset things differentially uh, by by gender, then potentially by the time we get to tenure promotion decisions, we're back to a place where signals are not being inflated for for men and 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 we can have sort of we can return to this this kind of uh, fair decision and therefore subsequent decisions would be would be fair as well. So I think yeah it, all of this stuff is very contextual like you have to really take seriously what the specifics of the setting are. But I think, especially when we're thinking about dynamic settings that sort of past and present discrimination, as, as we were talking about before, uh, you know, it could be that interventions at key points in time can, can forestall uh, accumulation of, of disparities over time. Thank you very much. And I think we're out of time. So if people have any more questions, I'm sure Peter will be more than happy to answer them over email. Uh, and uh, Peter, do we have this presentation to share uh, on our website? Or I can certainly share it. I don't think I have yet, but I'll, I'm happy to. If you can email it to us, that would be perfect. And then if uh, if you can include your contact info there, that would be perfect so that uh, people can find the right email to contact you. Otherwise, thank you very much. We'll be more than happy to see you on July 28th for our last talk of the season. And uh, on that note, we're gonna wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone, that was very fun.